Okay, it's a couple days later. As you can see, I got a different shirt on. I got, got my hair cut. And uh, I mixed everything down. And as I said, I wanted to share with you how I, uh, how I go about recording and mixing. And uh, I guess this video would be helpful for anybody that's new to recording. And I guess anybody that has a lot of experience, uh, maybe you can help me out. So if, you, if I'm doing something wrong, <laughs> uh, let me know. I do know uh, a, a fairly bit about uh, called the art of recording and and uh, and mixing and all that uh, enough to probably be dangerous. I would say most of my mixes are are hit or miss. Sometimes I get lucky, and other times I'll go back and listen to them, and I'm like, man, that that's that's terrible. The goal always is to try to sound professional, right? Like a professional recording. And uh, again, sometimes I think I'm getting close, but uh, other times, I, I, you know, I got to work out on a little bit more. But uh, I, I, guess, I guess, as far as me, it's kind of like my golf game. <laughs> I, know, I know the rules of, of golf, at least most of them, but yet still I struggle to break 100, and that's probably how it is for, for mixing and recording. But what I do know from, from uh, I guess, books I've read and watching tons of YouTube videos, I know, uh, I guess I know the, you know, what, <laughs> what you should be doing or the, ma the main points. And the first is, they always say, is a great performance. So a great performance makes the recording process a lot, a lot easier. And uh, somebody that has, say, good uh, vocal technique knows to, uh, you know, when they're screaming, back the mic away, or maybe it's a more intimate vocal part, get, get, getting a little closer. That makes it a lot easier for mix down. So if you have somebody like <laughs> Lady Gaga singing or Taylor Swift, uh, that makes the recording a lot easier. Same with guitar. You know, knowing uh, you know having a great instrument and someone that can play the guitar well, that also makes the mix process easier. So number one is a great performance. Number two, they say, is the room you're in. So the room can make a big difference. Uh, the microphone's going to pick up the sound of the room. If you're recording in a closet, it's going to be very, you know, it's going to be dead sounding uh, versus recording in a garage where you're going to get a lot of echo. Uh, if you do record in a closet, well, you could always add reverb, but if you record in a garage, uh, you can't really take that reverb sound away. So the room is very important. It's why a lot of studios have, you know, special treatment. They got special rooms for recording. Uh, you know, that, and you know, if they record drums, they may have a live room to get more of a live sound. So number two is, is the room. Number three is really how you place the, the microphones. And unless you're recording direct, uh, those microphones, you know, if you have the microphone far away, you're, you're going to get a different sound. You're going to get more of the room sound and versus if you have the microphone close to, to the, uh, the guitar. Uh, if you want to pick up more of the room sound, sometimes engineers will use uh, room, room mics. So uh, basically, again, you know, how that microphone is set up uh, in, in a different EQ, if you point it you know, more towards the hole, you might get a more bassier sound versus away from the hole. So a good engineer will, will know how to do that. So number three is, is you know, the, re the, the microphone placement. Number four is how well it's mixed. So a great mix engineer will, will know exactly how to mix the levels, how to pan things, and also how to correct for issues. If there's phase issues, a good engineer will know how to reverse that phase. Uh, if it's too boomy or there's too much bottom, they'll know how much uh, high-pass filtering to do with the, the EQing. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a whole art in itself, and a lot of... Uh, Top artists will hire uh, special mix engineers, that that's their specialty. And fifth and last is the mastering process. Basically, the final candy, basically making it louder so it's, you know, gives you that, that nice, loud, pumpy sound, maybe a little bit of EQ and some tweaking there. And there's, there's engineers that, that, you know, that just do mastering. And a lot of times, the professionals, after it goes to a mix engineer, they'll send it off to a mastering engineer, uh, which uh, might do different formats, different types of mixing, depending on whether it's on vinyl or you know CD, if anyone's still buying those, or just going to be streamed. 
So that's, that's the fifth. So with those five things, next I'm going to talk about each one of those and what I, what I did, uh, whether it was the right thing to do or, or whatever. Again, the pros, if there are any pros <laughs> watching this, maybe you can give me some tips. So that's next. Okay, so next I was going to talk about, I guess, how each one of those, I guess, five uh, areas, you know, performance, room, recording, mixing, et cetera. Uh, how they apply apply to me, but but first I forgot to mention there's actually a six item that's uh, somewhat important, but maybe not as important as the other five before it. Uh, really depends, and that's the the uh, the I guess the quality of the gear you have. Obviously, if you have a nice sounding guitar, it's going to sound better than a crappy guitar, or nice sounding drum set is going to sound better than a crappy drum set. Uh, but it really really gets down to uh, the performer. So somebody who is terrible at drums, who plays a, ni a really nice set, is not going to sound so good, whereas somebody who's a great drummer and plays a crappy drum set is probably going to make it, make it work. The other thing as far as recording gear goes, uh, yeah, good gear helps, but it, it really comes down to the knowledge of knowing how to, how to use it. And I know sometimes I can get obsessed with you know, wanting better gear, going out and buying better, better preamps and you know, buying a, you know, a high-end standalone uh, compressor. Uh, but gear these days, uh, you know, it's come a long way. And on a, on a low budget, you know, just spending a few hundred dollars on a, on a you know, a budget audio interface and with the things that you can do on a computer these days with plugins that replicate outboard gear, uh, you really don't need to spend a lot, a lot of money. Yes, it helps, you know, and maybe it gives you a certain color, uh, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to the knowledge. So the knowledge of knowing how to use it is far more important than than having, you know, high 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 end gear. So I just wanted to uh, get that out of the way. So back to my, uh, I guess, starting with my performance. So if I had to rate my performance for this particular. Five for, fri five for Friday, I guess is what I'm calling it, episode two. I give myself, I think, a B minus. I think my best song was probably Man in the Box. Uh, the other songs, uh, you know, well, you know, <laughs> they are what they are. <laughs> uh, a couple of them might be better th than others. I will tell you that I did this in two takes. First, I did a take on a, on a Thursday. Uh, and then I wasn't so happy with it. The first two songs I did, Plush and Man in a Box, I thought I did Plush pretty decent, and I thought, again, Man in a Box was the same as the, you know, the, one, the version on Friday. I thought my, my best. But the last three songs I did, like, like Today and, and uh, what was, you know, Paranoid Android and then the David Bowie slash Nirvana, song, I, I, I felt like that was a little bit flat, that I just wasn't really, you know, getting into those songs as much. So the next day, I, I re-recorded it, and unfortunately, Plush, in my opinion, didn't come out as good as the day before. Again, Man in the Box, I think I, I did that one, uh, fair, you know, it was a fairly de decent version. And the last three songs, I did a little bit better, but I still feel I could do those goes even better. But you know, it is what it is. You know, if I was playing live and you watched me, you know, maybe one or two songs I play well, and maybe the other two I'm, I'm a little off on. One thing I, I was thinking though, I, I, you know, Man in the Box I learned about three weeks ago. So let, let me back up. For, for, first, I, I wrote down five songs from the 90s. And then I realized, I go, I don't have any, any bands here or songs from the Seattle grunge period. And I really don't know a lot. So I went and I learned Plush by Stone Temple Pilots first. And I watched their, their old MTV Unplug video that was out, I guess, 93 or 94, whenever that was. Uh, and that, again, was about three weeks ago. And then two weeks back, I was listening to the radio. And I happened to hear a band, a band called Plush. It's a bunch of female rockers. And they were doing a version of Man in the Box, uh, acoustic version that was just killer. And I'm like, man, what a great song, and what a great version they did. So I decided to, to learn that. And I think 
that that song, because it's my most recent, I still like feel the energy when I'm playing it. I can get more emotionally involved with it. It may not come across, you may think my version sucks, but I felt like I was more into that song. So again, back to performance, you know, if the performance is on, even if you're, you know, singing off key a little bit or miss a couple notes, it makes such a big, big, big difference. It makes it easier to mix and record. So at any rate, I got that out of the way. As far as my, my room that I'm in, I'm in a room that's over my, my garage. It's shaped like a rectangle. And it's got these dormer ceilings. You might even see them come, coming down. I do not have any sound treatment. I know the pros would recommend that you get some sound treatment because you might get reflections coming off the ceiling. At some point, I'll probably maybe do that if I can find something that's within in my budget. I know some folks even make their own treatment. Uh, on the floor, I do have rugs, so that, you know, that dampens things a little bit, so, so it's not too, like, echoey in here, and I, you know, have some furniture in the room and all that. So that's my room. So performance, my room. Next is my recording setup. I'll start off with, with the vocal. I'm using a Shure Beta 58. It's a super, super cardi cardioid mic. For folks that aren't familiar with the cardioid, it's basically like a heart shape where it picks up the sound, but behind it, it rejects that. It's used a lot on, you know, stage where they use dynamic microphones like this microphone, uh, you know, where the artists are yelling and, you know, screaming away. Uh, but again, it's, it, it's not picking up the other instruments. It mainly just picks up the vocal. Super cardioid takes it a step further. And the benefit of that is, is that it will reject more of my guitar. So I don't get a lot of guitar bleed into it. You're only picking up the vocal. The downside of the super cardi cardioid is uh, sometimes when I'm playing my guitar, I do this a lot, I'm trying to remember where the heck do I put my hand. I turn my head like this, and I drop off very quickly, which you might be able to notice. So this is why I've been wearing some headphones lately, is to so I can tell if if I'm if I'm dropping off. And by the way, if if you're wondering uh, if you know a little bit about my microphones, the difference between a, a Shure 58 versus a Shure 58 Beta is the 58 is cardioid, and again the 58A Beta is super cardioid, and they're all based on the more famous Shure SM57, the good rock and roll mic used probably more than any other mic for recording, uh, <coughs> recording loud guitar amplifiers or sna snare drums. So they're all they're all the same, just different capsules. This is cardioid as, as well. So as far as the preamp, this microphone is going into. I have an old. PV, I think it's a VMP2, it's a tube, two-channel preamp that I got in the, in the mid-90s. mid, mid, mid -90s. Uh, One of the channels I gotta get fixed, but obviously this channel's working. So I'm going through that, so that's outboard gear that I have, and then that's going over to my Tascam Model 12 mixer slash multi-track recorder. And that's going into, uh, I think it was channel, channel one. As far as the guitar, I'm using an AKG 460, a small condenser microphone. This is also cardi cardioid. I don't know if it, even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But uh, this microphone, I think when I recorded this five for Friday, I had it maybe seven inches away had it pointed where the neck and the body meets. I know a lot of pros recommend, recommend that. Uh, I had it slightly pointed in a little bit towards the sound hole, but not right on the sound hole, because as the pros will tell you, it can get very boomy if you have that microphone too close to the sound hole, and it sounds like crap, because I've made that mistake plenty, plenty of times. But uh, yes, yeah, so I have that microphone about seven or inches away. Now, ideally, if I was just trying to capture the full body of the acoustic, 
on on one mic, I would probably have it like a, maybe a foot, foot and a half, maybe even two feet away uh, to to do that. Uh, whereas if you have it too close, uh, and sometimes I do, it, it's hitting hitting too much of the strings, and you're just not getting that full acoustic sound. But the downside is the further away I put that mic, the more bleed it's getting from my vocal, and I could have phase issues where they end up canceling each each other out. So. That is why I have it some, somewhat close. I mean, I'm always getting a little bit of bleed in, in each. Uh, so that's that setup. And also, I decided for this particular Five for Friday that I was going to be real simple and only use two mics, the vocal and a mic on guitar. I'm uh, old school. I did not plug in and go direct like I, like I did on the last Five for Friday I did, episode one, where I tried to... <laughs> sing these uh, songs from these great women artists. By the way, if I had to redo that, I, I would probably knock it down a step and go to a lower, lower key. But uh, there I tried to get fancy. I had a room mic, you know, four or five feet out to capture the room. I was plugged in direct, and I had the mic on the guitar. And uh, if, I was, if my mixing skills were, were better, uh, that might have all worked, but I think I had some issues. Uh, with that, uh, but anyway, I went with it anyway, and I uploaded it on onto YouTube. As far as this microphone, this mic is going into an, uh, my my Focusrite ISA one preamp. Bought it used a few years back, and it's it's a pretty well known pr preamp. Uh, a lot of pros uh, use this. It was. Design, I, I believe, by a uh, you know, famous uh, designer who d d designed some famous uh, uh, mixing boards, Neve mixing boards. Uh, Neve 1073 is one of the most famous. But he supposedly uh, designed this preamp in, in the mid-80s, mid for what that's worth. Uh, so at any rate, my guitar is going uh, from there, and then that also goes into my, my Tascam uh, Model 12. So that's that's my recording uh, setup, and next I'll talk about how I how I mix mix this. Okay, so I just want to talk about how I how I mix this uh, this particular five for Friday. Uh, basically, everything was uh, mixed and recorded again on my Tascam model model twelve. Uh, Typically, or sometimes, I would take the, uh, the the individual tracks and load them up into my to my digital audio workstation and mix it down down here. But here, I decided to to mix everything uh, down on the on the on the model model twelve. And uh, basically, when it comes to mixing, I, I generally try to follow one of two models. I should say recording and mixing. Uh, one of them is if anybody's ever watched on YouTube. There's NPR Tiny Desk, and they they uh, those sessions. Well, they they have either you know famous artists or they have some some you know not so famous artists that are typically unplugged. Uh, might be just you know a singer with their guitar or maybe it's a piano or something. And the person that records those sessions, he uses these. Uh, they're kind of high end uh, directional. Mics that you would use in a in a I guess um, you know to rec to film a movie uh, for sound or maybe a TV show, and from what I read, they're they're stereo uh, mics that he's typically using. And the nice thing about uh, NPR is it's just so stripped down. He doesn't add any reverb. You feel like you're right in the room. And sometimes, uh, particular on the on the older uh, older shows. Uh, if the artist moves around a little bit, they kind of go from the left to the, to the right, which technically isn't perfect, right? But it's kind of uh, cool to see, you know, that it's, you know, just kind of a live human there playing, and it is what it, you know, is what it is. So that's uh, one way I like to record. And in order to do that, again, I don't have the directional mics, I just, I, but I do have a couple stereo mics. So some of my YouTube videos, I've done that. Uh, where I've just, uh, I think Baker Street, I can't remember which ones, two or three, I've, I've just used a stereo mic just to, you know, experiment. The the other, uh, I guess, model I try to follow is where I can find artists that are, again, just them and their acoustic guitar, 
playing live, record it. And typically, I'll, I'll go to Howard Stern's uh, show. He's got a lot of musical guests. Uh, obviously, most of those are, <laughs> are pretty famous folks. Uh, sometimes they're all plugged in, but uh, a lot of times he's, he's got a, a number of, uh, you know, videos that he's put up there where they're just stripped down and uh, using a microphone like I have, like a Shure SM5058 or something like that, and singing, and they're, they're plugged in, they're recording direct, usually kind of they're doing both, from what I noticed, they're direct and with, uh, with a microphone on the guitar, and I try to try to follow that as best I as best I can. I can never quite get there, uh, you know. I guess uh, again, they're they're <laughs> they're probably you know they're, they're they're much more skilled engineers, and there's much more going on, I'm sure, in the mixing end. But that's what I try to do. So for this particular session, what I actually tried to do again, I mixed everything on here. And uh, I wanted to, to mix it uh, as if you were hearing exactly what I was hearing when I, when I recorded this. So when I went to record this, it was important for me to set all my levels, uh, tweak the EQ and effects, because I had the headphones on. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, that I could get it exactly the way I wanted to hear it. Uh, as if, you know, I was listening off a live board, which I was. So when I mixed this down to two tracks after I, after I recorded everything, I didn't change anything. Or if I did, it was very little in a couple of spots. So if you happen to listen to my, my, uh, this particular Five for Friday, episode two, it is exactly the way I heard it in, in, my, in my head and mixed it down. Good or, good or bad. The only additional fluff I, I'd say I put on it is in the uh, mastering process when I moved it to my, to my DAW. Uh, so that's that's how I mixed it. Uh, let's see here. Just a couple other things, I guess. Uh, basically, when I when I record on here and I say, you know, you should always watch your levels in the digital world. In the early days, I used to try to uh, bring it close to zero, which was really a stupid thing. You have no headroom and you get digital distortion. So when I mix, I'm sorry, when I recorded this, uh, and uh, actually most of the time when I record, I try to keep all the levels at, at negative 12. Uh, to give myself headroom. So again, if you're new to recording and all, just watch your levels. The Tascam gives you a line. You probably can't see it here, but uh, where negative 12 is, so you can monitor that. Uh, let me see, get myself back here. But at any rate, uh, that's that. So going down the channel. So again, I try to keep this real simple. I didn't record direct. I just used two mics. The vocal mic is is on on channel one, and then uh, again I'm using an outboard preamp, but then technically it is going a little bit through the Tascam preamp as well. Then I have a low cut uh, filter, also known as a high pass filter, uh, and that's set. Uh, it only gives you one choice here. It's a it's a it's a hundred hertz, so that keeps out any of that low rumble that you may have, you know, if you've got an air conditioner going or things get too bassy. A lot of times i made mistakes in the past not having that on and, uh, you know, that I'm <laughs> you, again, you learn from your mistakes, but I, I have that on. Then I, uh, I put a little bit of compression, just kind of touching it. I don't go overboard with, with this. Then as far as EQ, uh, it looks like for the vocal, I cut down a little bit of the highs. Maybe I thought it was too harsh. I boosted a tiny bit of the mids for the vocal, and I think the reason I did that was I was trying to separate it from the guitar where I cut a little bit in the mids, so uh, you know, so that they're not overlapping each other in the same frequency. And then it looks like both, I kind of cut the bass down a, a slight, you know, a, a little bit here. Then uh, as far as the auxiliaries here, I sent auxiliary one is going to my outboard effects, which is an Alesis Microverb 3 that I bought in the 90s. I think I have it set on small room and only like on one click, just a very little bit. That's actually coming in back into channels seven and eight because it's in stereo. And then, uh, and then, yeah, the guitar, same thing, a little bit of uh, compression. I already mentioned the EQ. Uh, and also going to the Alesis and by the way, in internal effects, I'm also using a little bit of that as well. And I think that's set to 
delay slash haul. Lately, I've been using that quite a bit. And not, not a lot going on on here. Then in terms of panning, I typically pan the vocal to about 12.30, 1 o'clock. And I pan the guitar to maybe 10.30, 11 o'clock. Maybe even as far left as 10 o'clock. I do that to give it space in the mix. So I'm not going straight down the middle. And uh, basically, if you were sitting in front of me, the, uh, I, the, my vocal would be a little bit to the right, and my guitar would be a little bit to the left, because that's where the guitar hole is. So it w you would never hear it straight down the middle if you're right in, you know, right in front of me. And then the, uh, the effects here, the Elisis reverb, uh, I actually, I could have panned it down the middle, and I probably did originally, and it will equally spread it left and right, but I decided to pan that further to the right, and I think I found that as I brought that up and panned it to the right, it just opened up the mix a little bit more and you know, give you more of that stereo feel. But uh, with all that said, uh, let's take a quick listen to, if I press this button down here, this is the original two-track mix I did that I later put into my DAW and then added a little bit of fluff <laughs> with the mastering. So this is, uh, I think I have uh, Man in the Box. So let's listen to a little, little bit of, you know, Alice in Chains, Man in the Box, the Rob version. that on pause for a second. I'm going to show you a couple other things here. So uh, th that literally is what I mixed probably, I guess, last last Friday. Now, since then, I've used this mixer a couple times. So I don't know if I have the exact settings. So this could be, you know, slightly different. Every little tweak can, can make a change. So I'm going to shut off the two, the two track mix. And now I'm going to play, you know, what this sounds like, you know, individually. And then I'll show you a few other things. So let's see, well, we'll see how close I am now to that mix. My shit. So let me let me do this. So I muted the effects. I'm gonna pan everything in the middle. You can still hear me. So this is the this is the dry, pretty much the dry, except for the EQ and the compression. This is the dry mono mix, and you always want to listen to things. Sorry, you always want to listen to things in mono too to make sure you don't have any phase issues. So let me let me bring everything back. I want to show you one more thing here. Of my nose and shit. Won't you come? So if I solo the vocal, Save remember before me. I said I had a super cordioid mic, which uh, Save me. helps me prevent the bleed of the guitar getting Be through. And if you listen to that, you don't Can hear you a lot of guitar. Jesus so I think I did a, I think I did a pretty Christ. good job of uh, cutting out the guitar he there, is isolating the vocal. Now tries. if I go over here, we'll be wasted. So, so that was the guitar, and as you could tell, 
uh, I, I, I uh, isolated it uh, so you don't hear as much as the vocal. Maybe not quite as well as the vocal was isolated, but again, that microphone was a cardioid mic, not a super cardioid. And if I had a directional mic, <laughs> like those high-end mics they use on NPR, uh, I, uh, I, I might have been able to, to isolate that, that further. So that's, that's it. That's how, I, uh, you know, that's how I went about mixing this. And uh, <clears throat> again, I, I wanted to do kind of a live mix off the board so anybody listening to me can hear exactly what it would be off the board. Uh, and when you're doing something live, you don't always have the luxury of fixing things either, right? <laughs> And I guess next, uh, yeah, I'll show you uh, how, how I how I master this. Okay, the final stage here, mastering. Uh, so again, for folks that are you know kind of new to recording and don't know what mastering is, it's basically the final uh, stage that a that a mastering and engineer would do uh, with a two track mixed down and. Basically, um, you know, basic making it you know louder, sweetening, sweetening up, sweetening it up, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know gluing it, gluing everything together. Uh, so, for example, you know maybe maybe an artist went to like three different studios, and it was mixed by three different engineers. Uh, some of the tracks are louder, some of them are softer. The mastering engineer will will glue everything together so everything you know fits on the album and you know kind of has the same same uh, I guess uh, audio loudness uh, level and they do they do pump pump up the loudness uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, they also have some uh, some very high end gear, outboard gear, uh, multi band compressors, EQs, uh, limiters. Uh, I guess uh, high-end audio converters, you know, you know that 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 type of stuff, and years and years of experience. Uh, but these days, if you have a computer, uh, you can do a lot of this on your computer with with plugins. And uh, there's some really good plugins. There's some mastering plugins that you can download. I actually own one that I occasionally uh, use. Uh, that uh, you can get, you know, s similar re results as as the pro if you know what you're doing. And by the way, I'm not a hundred percent there yet. I'm trying my best, and I experiment, and I try different things when I do this. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So anyway, that's a little little background here. So we are in my DAW here. I use I I use uh, Logic Pro, uh, and uh, Logic Pro comes with a lot of stock plugins. And uh, what I did here was I brought in the the two track that I that I had mixed on on my Tascam 12, so I have a left and a right channel for for, for that. And uh, as I said earlier, you want to make sure that you have a lot of headroom when you're mixing. So I recorded at minus 12. I brought this in at minus 12 uh, because you want to give your mastering engineer room so they can make things louder. Uh, and if it's you know, pushed all the way up to zero, there's not going to be a lot of headroom there, and, uh, you know, you risk digital distortion and all sorts of stuff. So, at any rate, I brought that in that way, but after I brought it in, I did bump up the levels a little bit. Looks like I brought this up, uh, you know, to 1.8. Uh, and then uh, on the, I guess, the mix bus or the mastering bus, uh, you can see I added a a gain plug in here, and I just bumped this up one decibel. And the nice thing about putting the a gain plug in on your master, you can also check uh, at least with Logic here uh, whether uh, it sounds good in mono or not. That's why I do that. So that's always the first thing I do. Then I added an EQ here, and uh, I'll call this what I normally do is what they call subtractive EQing first. And I'll, I'll either do this on an individual track, if I recorded individual tracks, like vocal, guitar, drums, uh, bass, et cetera. But I do subtractive EQing mostly. So here, uh, as far as my first EQ, so my first EQ, um, um, again, I'm cutting out uh, these lows here. I did it on, on the Tascam Model 12 as I was tracking, but I just as a safety thing, I cut it out here. I also cut a you know a little bit of this high end that most people can't hear. I cut that out. Then 
I also, most of the time when I record, there's this very high piercing frequency where I, uh, around the high three, uh, actually this was around the high two, I'm sorry, high two, 3K range, I cut that out, very narrow band. Uh, I can demo how I, I'll show you how I even look. Well, maybe I'll show you later. <laughs> I'll just keep moving. But I cut, I cut that out. It looks like I bumped up stuff here just a tiny bit. But usually my first EQ is a, what they call subtractive EQing. I believe the pros call it that. Then after that, I put in a, a compressor. Now, I could have put in a, 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 what they call a multiband compressor. Uh, Logic does give you that, and that's what a lot of uh, mastering engineers will use, where you can focus in on each, each band. And sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. Here I was trying to keep things simple. And Logic's compressor is actually, there's multiple compressors that they've modeled uh, after, well, they modeled after real compressors. So for example, this Vintage Opto, I believe that's uh, Universal Audio's famous LA2, uh, compressor, which I think costs like, I don't know, three or four thousand uh, dollars. So anyway, that's one type of a compressor they modeled after. Uh, I'm trying to th see what else here. I won't go through all of them here, but I believe this is also modeled, this one here, this FET, after a famous compressor called the uh, uh, Universal Audio also, 1176. Uh, that a lot of people love. They love it on drums and all that. Then the compressor that I, I happen to use for this is a vintage VCA, and I believe that's modeled after uh, another famous compressor called the SSL G-Bus compressor that a lot of mix engineers will use on their, you know, their, 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 their two-track stereo mix mix down. And I just very lightly hit this here, and I'll demo that too uh, in, a, in a bit. So I have, you know, subtractive EQ, then I have the, uh, the, the, the vintage SSL G-Bus compressor. Then what I did, I added some EQ using uh, Logic's uh, vintage tube EQ, and this is supposed to be ma uh, modeled after a, another famous uh, uh, I guess, equalizer called a Pultec, used, I believe, on a lot of Beatle albums. And Pultecs, I think they're known for their, their warm sound. So uh, I, and I only used the top half of this because I still don't know <laughs> how to use the, the bottom yet frequencies uh, da da down there. But what I did here was, well, first I, I cut out more. I wanted to make sure anything above 100. I cut out a little bit more of that. But then I did a little, uh, from watching another YouTube on somebody using a Pultec, a little trick that they say you know, a lot of mix engineers might do. I added back some low boost to give this some, some worth. So where, where I cut, I actually matched and put it back back here. And all these things are very, very subtle. And then it looks like I put a little bit of a high-end boost, just a tiny bit here. I must have been doing this, you know, or, or whatever, around 6, 6K. Uh, and then a tiny little bit of drive here. Again, all these things are subtle and to, to taste. Then, uh, so that's added EQ. So I got subtractive EQ and kind of a little bit of added e EQ after the compressor. Then I felt like I needed to glue things better and put them back in a room. Uh, this is not a Logic uh, plugin. This is a third party, but a, a, it's a great one. It's got great you know, uh, uh, recommendations and great reviews. And I think a lot of pros might even use this as well. But it's this Valla Halle, if I'm pronouncing it right, vintage verb. What I did here was I uh, added in a little bit of ambience. They have a bunch of presets that you can choose, you know, hall, plate, you know, chamber, th things of that nature. I just put a little bit of ambience. It's very low down in the mix in a slight delay because I just felt like that kind of glued things, as I said, together. Uh, then after that, I have kind of the star of all mastering is an adaptive li limiter. This is really where you make things loud. And uh, since I had already boosted 
uh, previously the levels up to, you know, uh, that were coming in and I boosted up the gain. I didn't have to do much here. I just brought it up a couple decibel, uh, I guess a couple decibels. I think logic defaults to three. Now I could really pump this up if I wanted to, but I did not want to do that. And then I have a ceiling here just to make sure I don't clip. And I'm told that YouTube prefer, where I upload these videos, prefers everything at minus one. So uh, that's where I put that. Uh, previously, I used to just go to you know, minus a half a decibel. And that's down down here, uh, down in this area where you'll, you'll see that. Then the last thing I have is a loudness meter. And the standard that uh, most of the pros are using, uh, everybody, for loudness is what they call LUFS. And for YouTube, um, I'm told uh, not to go beyond minus 14. Otherwise, they may you know, compress your, your song or chop things off or whatever and kind of cut out the dynamics of it. So I'm very careful. I have a setting up here right here where I set that at minus 14, and then I just watch this. Typically, uh, I don't know, it varies. So, you know, sometimes I might have uploaded videos right at 14 or beyond, uh, but most of the acoustics lately, I'm trying to keep like uh, around, you know, 15, 16, maybe even minus 17, it depends. I think on this, this, these, this these five songs I did, in some cases, for parts of it, I'm probably right at minus 14. In other parts, I might be around 17. But overall, I think I came out around minus 15 or 16 range. So uh, that's that. So I guess I'll just, uh, maybe I'll just, I'll play you he here, uh, you know, a little bit with everything on. And then I'll shut everything down. And you'll see, if, you know, I don't know if the difference is going to show up so much on YouTube here. Uh, but let me just play a little little clip here. Again, this is ma man, man in the Box. Notice that drop with that 2B EQ. Now the adoptive, adoptive limiter. Whoop, I'm sorry. I meant the, uh, <laughs> the reverb. Now the adaptive Turn everything Save back on. We're back to the beginning here. So, at any rate, uh, hopefully that helps. You see what I've done here, and uh, as I said, I'm I'm still learning myself. I, I've I've yet to you know. You know, record myself and mix myself and then master myself and then felt like I sounded like a professional record. <laughs> I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm still working, working on that. You know, something where you're in your car and you're cranking and it just sounds awesome. I mean, that's what a lot of mix engineers and mastering engineers do, by the way. They, they, they go out and they keep tweaking back and forth and they go out into a car and uh, hear how it sounds, because if it sounds good in a car, it usually sounds good anywhere. I have a feeling, I haven't played any of my stuff in a car yet, but if I crank, cranked it up, it might sound a little bit harsh. Uh, but I'm still working on it. I think I'm slowly getting there. And as far as uh, mastering, yeah, you know, when I'm doing this, I try different things. You know, I, I have, a, I'll just show you real quick, I do have a mastering plugin uh, that's real simple to use. I use it once in a while. Where the heck is it? Down here. IK Multimedia. Larson Mastering Console. By the way, this is modeled after, there's a, uh, I guess there's this famous uh, uh, or, or, or well-known industry 
per person. I don't know if his name is Lorson, but anyway, he does mastering with real, real equipment, but they, they made this plugin that's supposed to model that equipment. Uh, so I'll use this once in a while, too. It can really crank, you know, pump up the volume, so to speak, uh, and there's different frequencies you can play around with it. I sometimes feel like for acoustic, it's a little overkill, but it's probably because I don't know how to use it yet. But uh, that's it. So I showed you that, a little demo. Uh, that's it for the mastering. And, and maybe next I'll just kind of summarize things, and that'll be the end of this. Thank you. Hey, if you, uh, if you made it to the end here, thanks, thanks for uh, watching. You know, this video was originally only, only going to be like maybe five or ten minutes long. And uh, what, I, what I was going to do was attach it to my, my latest five or for Friday, uh, uh, I guess, video, episode two, <clears throat> where I do these five uh, cover songs. And uh, usually there are those videos, uh, and I just started this, uh, they're usually only like, say, 25, 30 minutes long. And I wanted to attach this to the end, to, end of that, you know, and kind of explain, you know, how I recorded everything. And when I got into this, uh, I just kept, you know, going and going. And the next thing I know, this thing is like, it's probably close to 50 minutes long now. So uh, I decided to make this a, a separate video. So anybody that watch, watches or has watched this, if you want to go check out the, the actual songs that I mixed down, it's a separate video loaded up around the same time. It's called Five for Friday, uh, Episode 2. And again, uh, if, you're, if you're new to recording, uh, hopefully you found this helpful. And uh, if you're a more seasoned, you know, audio engineer, you know, let, let me know. Uh, <laughs> let me know how I'm doing or where, where I can improve. Uh, I guess one last thing I will say, I did, you know, I have recently started these Five for Fridays where I do five cover songs and maybe once or twice a month I load it up on a Friday. That's why it's called, you know, Five for Friday. And uh, I plan on experimenting a lot with that, trying different microphone techniques, different microphones, different equipment, different recording equipment. I have my four-track gold a cassette recorder from the 80s. I have a, an RME baby face. I have the Tascam Model 12 that I just went over. I also have an old Elisa's black face. I don't know if it works or not. But I plan on experimenting, uh, maybe not in the beginning, uh, but somewhere along the line with those episodes, I'm going to try that. And uh, if you're into that stuff, you know, you could, could follow me. But uh, otherwise, yeah, again, I know this was a long video, and uh, that's it. I hope to see, uh, see you folks soon. Thanks.